All right, so this is the 1003A round two technical assistance session. Um, you will um, notice that there are a lot of similarities to the round one um, that uh, we um, rolled out last spring um, and did want to roll this out to give an opportunity for um, those schools that are um, on the newly um, uh, distributed rising stars school list an opportunity for these funding as well as those for this funding, excuse me, as well as those schools that did not receive, may not have received any um, in the um, first round. So um, just real quickly, I um, am going to um, go ahead and let you know who else on the, from the Title I team is on this um, call, but if everybody can mute themselves, that would be great. And um, we do have a, um, session or excuse me a section at the end for um questions so if we could just hold those that would also um be great so gabby Pinge, title one director and we also have a couple members from the title one team you guys want to go ahead and introduce yourselves really quickly sure good morning everyone this is karen gordon and i'm here with uh this is christina cote good morning awesome thank you um, again, session is being recorded for those um, on your teams that may not have been able to make it, and we will send the um, recording shortly um, after, afterwards. <clears throat> okay. Oops, let me see here. Let me... Okay, here we go. Okay, eligibility. I know there was um, a little bit con of confusion with the um, eligible schools list. Um, for appendices or excuse me, appendix, I think it's appendix A. Um, so just to be clear, um, as far as el eligibility goes, so it's round two funding. Um, it is for those schools um, that are on the current rising stars list or so CSI schools and who did not receive any funding during um, round one. So, um, Again, if there's a school that is on um, the list but did receive some uh, funding, even if it wasn't fully funded, but some kind of partial funding um, during the first round, and the, that school is not um, eligible. However, if there was a school that did not receive any funding during round one and that school um, is currently on the rising um, stars list, then that school is eligible for this round two funding. And also just want to remind folks that um, we'll be rolling out the FY19, so for um, title 10 to 3A fund for the 18-19 school year, um, just in the coming months. Um, so that funding will also be available. And this, and that'll be, a, um, uh, we anticipate that'll be a lot more pending, you know, the. Um, appropriations from the federal government, but um, this uh, round two funding is just about uh, about $1.5 million as the application states. Um, hey, Gabby, this is Lauren in Washoe County. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I couldn't hear, you got kind of garbled there about talking about funding for FY19. Can you please repeat that? Yes, I was just saying that um, we will be rolling out the 1003A RFA for the 18-19 school year in the coming months. And the schools that um, are eligible now are the same schools that are going to be eligible for that next round of funding? That That is correct. Thank you. No problem. Any school on that current rising star list, correct? That is correct. Okay, let me, oh, I don't know why, there we go. Okay, and um, again, do, um, keeping with the state priorities, we are prioritizing um, uh, plans that um, align with our state priorities, school leadership, data informed decision making. Um, so just reiterating that there. And then timeline, yes, this is a super tight timeline. Um, our team available to give technical assistance um, uh, to um, districts that uh, who may need it, um, but did want to get this funding out to schools as soon as possible. And so that is um, 
why there's this real um, tight timeline there. Um, and again, any questions we can just talk about at the end. And this is also um, in the application. Just wanted to let you guys know applications um, are due to NDE by five on the 24th. And we can talk more about that a little bit later. The um, as the evidence levels remain, um, 1003A funding can only fund um, intervention strategies and activities that meet tiers one, two, and three. So strong, moderate, and promising. This is nothing that um, has changed from the um, round one, and it will not change for the um, upcoming uh, spring um, application. Just wanted to re reiterate that as well. <clears throat> and here um, is one. Um, ooh, oopsie. So let me go back to it. I apologize. Okay, here we go. So the um, as you will see in the application on this is page nine. There um, is a, a cover page there that has the school as evidence tiers of intervention that the school is asking for, um, and then the need of the school. Um, and this will um, this will help us, and you'll see in a few slides when I talk about just kind of the priority of how the review teams will review the applications. Um, uh, will help us determine kind of which um, priority or round of review um, the review team will be reviewing this in. So. Um, there you have the school name, you will have the you know tier. So here's an example, it would be like level two if they're with, um, you know, say a, a partner on the state approved um, uh, list. Um, and then if there's like a math curriculum, name that math curriculum, and it again would have to meet levels one, two, or three. And then you would just determine the needs of the school. Um, that, um, will be as far as like you know needs go um that will be determined um really by the um lea so high moderate you know some things to think about are you know uh, scores um and and that kind of thing you know on the on the csi list that would be a high need um so again this cover page um um we try to make it super simple and straightforward and just easier for um um, us to really determine what um, type of review or what round of review as far as priorities goes. Um, so that is there. And again, if there are any questions, we can talk about that um, at the end. Um, again, prioritizing funding. So um, on just wanted to make a note, and this is on page five of the application. But that these funds, because it is so late in the year, we will, we will be also prioritizing planning. Um, um, you know, again, because it, it is so late in the year, um, you know, we it, it, and just feedback that we have heard um, from um, some districts and, and principals just wouldn't make much sense to um, have implementation of some kind of plan. Um, however, planning, doing like a needs assessment. Um, Will be will be prioritized for these next few months and again these and it says that in the application but just a reminder these funds will need to be um, expended by june 30th um, of this year so those are planning and of course prioritizing the most rigorous um, levels of essa evidence and um, here is the chart um, that appears on page 16 of um, kind of how uh, the department is going to go about reviewing these. So um, just a call out right now that um, where it says C, so that orange does not apply um, to this grant because again, this grant can only um, be used to fund intervention, intervention strategies, activities that um, meet as the evidence tiers one, two, or three. But so um, if we're looking at the red, so A, so um, A, group A um, would be for those um, applications that have strategies, intervention activities, um, all of the intervention strategies activities meet tiers um, one, two, and three. 
Um, and from there, you could, or um, applications could be either A1, A2, um, or an um, A3, depending on the priority level. So your A1, that means that you have the um, highest evidence tiers and um, the schools demonstrate the um, highest need. A2, that means that all um, evidence, uh, excuse me, um, interventions, programs, activities, um, again, meet evidence tiers one, two, and three, um, but the school needs are moderate. A3, same thing, but low. And then B, we get into B, is um, B, um, would actually, now I'm looking at this, actually not apply um, either because we cannot, again, if you, if, if an intervention did have, um, you know, met tiers one, two, or three, we could only fund that. We could not fund whatever the tier four um, intervention strategy or activity was. So um, this is just also to give um, folks an idea of how um, in the future, so for like the um, R phase will be coming out in the spring for the 18-19 school year of how um, we will be prioritizing the review of um, applications. And then this is the rubric on page 17. Um, you can see here, it, especially from round one, it's um, uh, definitely condensed. Um, and so um, we really just wanted to streamline it, um, make it um, easier for um, districts applying for these funds. Um, you see there, it, it's really about um, comprehensive and holistic planning um, for, for school improvement there. Um, clearly defined roles, system level coherence and alignment um, is definitely a focus. Um, the commitment to school improvement, um, which would be, again, the, as the evidence tiers and um, the um, alignment with state priorities, um, as well as needs of the schools. Um, and then lastly, budget summary and narrative. And, um, now we will get into the application um, narrative questions, which you can find on page 10, um, pages 10 and 11 of the application. So let me see. And uh, Christina and Karen will um, lead this, this section. Oh, let me just... Make sure I apologize. I am not privy to to go to meeting. Okay, Karen and um, Christina. Let's see. Great. This is Karen. Good morning. Um, this is a, this is much simplified uh, method and application. And if you um, look at slide eleven, um, we we want to kind of set the background for you that per our ESSA state plan and our, our um, state improvement plan, um, the, the um, shift in support that the state provides to, um, to districts is shifting from individual schools to the LEA. And you hopefully that will help you understand um, the narrative part of the application. The focus uh, is we want to build some system alignment. It's no longer on the school to fix itself. It's, it's now a district system that will produce um, improvements in school achievement across the state of Nevada. Uh, we want to look, and so when we're, when we're reviewing these applications, we'll be looking for that. We'll be looking to see that um, there's not a conflict between district, what the district is doing and what schools are doing. That we're not that systems aren't working against themselves. Um, the state, we want to we want to support the district and um, support the initiatives uh, for school improvement. And then, but but systems we see that aren't working, we're 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 not going to um, we're going to try to work with you to remove that. Um, 
We want to guide you to use the resources um, to improve school leader capacity at the district level and at the school level. And of course, ESSA is very focused on opportunity gaps for all of our sub -pops. Um This means, in a nutshell, that we are working to improve capacity, coherence, and connections between the state, the district, and your school. So that's the big shift in, uh, in mindset that is um, taking place here. Um, any questions with that at this point? Uh, yeah, this is Lauren Olin over in Washoe County. What exactly do you mean by guide LEA to use resources? What resources are you talking about? We're going, Lauren, thanks for that wonderful question. We're, Christina and I are going to um, provide an example for that within the context of this application in just a moment. So hold that and we, if I don't sufficiently answer the question, let me know at the end of this, okay? Thank you. Sure. And, and Karen, so, just, just tell me when to move on to the next slide. Okay, so yes, would you move on? Thank you, Gabby, I forgot about that part. To slide 12. So looking at the application narrative portion of this, um, we, as you see, have asked for um, district and school strategy. But I want to remind you that on, um, on page eight, the, uh, the um, notes that you put into your application uh, are single spaced and please don't exceed seven pages for um, the district and the collective part of the plan and one page for each school. So that will help guide you with knowing how much information to, to include. Um, so the district synopsis um, of analysis for the strategy. Here, here's an example um, of, of what might be out there that would apply to this situation. Okay. So here's the here's the context. You're a district, you have a high school, um, many of your high schools, and they don't have a common interim assessment. Um, within your district, you're aware that you have some very, very underperforming sub pops, such as an IEP, Black, or Native, and Native American. Your district plan would highlight this and would, uh, your DPP, would address these issues. For example, perhaps the district plan would ask for uh, a way to improve sub-pop achievement uh, and graduation rates, uh, grading local, state, and federal funding uh, to provide PD, uh, and work on truly analyzing uh, data to determine how to shift instructional practices that work to improve student achievement for the sub pops. And there may be a plan to purchase a um, highly effective common interim assessment for high schools. I'm not saying that's the case. I'm saying per, as this pretend scenario, if this is what the data shows for the district, that's probably in a very short synopsis what your uh, plan to improve your district might look like. Are we good so far? Or do we have questions? Uh, this is April. I have a question. Sure. Hi, Karen. Um, Hi. So the district performance plan for the 2017-18 school year has already been written and is due to the state January 31st. Um, are you asking us to begin working on a district performance plan specific to our rising star schools? Your district performance plan should in the future, and remember this is a shift in thinking, um, should encompass all of the data for all of your schools, but with a focus on school achievement across all schools. 
Okay, yeah, we have obviously so increasing proficiency, graduation rates, closing achievement gaps, all of that in our district performance plan already. Okay, and I'm saying great, but it would probably in the future look a little different than before because we're asked, the, the focus is shifting from each school to the district. So if you have a one-star school or or a school on the CSI list, many of them, you should be analyzing the data and looking at what are your, what are the common um, trends. gaps or trends in student achievement with a focus on equity. That's a shift with ESSA. And then based on this information, when you, when you write your plan, you would not only acknowledge that, you would put forth a system-wide uh, intervention to help these schools to improve. It's no longer on the school to do all the work. It's a big shift in thinking, but that's what S is asking the state to do. And it's kind of beginning here with this, this application. I would think, April, that you would be, you would use your district, for this application, you'd use your district plan as is, but be aware of this and if if you're if you've already done this, great. But if not, um, that's what the state will be looking at. Does that help? Yeah, I just was looking for clarification as to whether or not we needed to um, develop a new district performance plan uh, for the purposes of this application. No, absolutely not. No. Just be aware that this is a shift that's occurring and that you should look at it. And if you see gaps between your district performance plan when you write this application, and then you might want to make note for when you do rewrite the district performance plan. Is that okay, helpful? Thank you. Yeah, yep. thank you. Yeah, April, this is Christina. Just to kind of reiterate or piggyback on what Karen said, just like a school performance plan, you're checking data and you're either determining pivots or perseveres based on the activities. Uh, it would be just a similar situation. So now there's a bigger emphasis on CSI. Uh, districts received um, new, da new data through this year prior to probably when the district performance plan was last visited, <clears throat> depending on your timeline. So you would just revisit that district performance plan and make any maybe um, pivots as needed because now CSI's schools um, are supposed to get um, prioritized for district support as well as state support. We've been engaged in developing our district performance plan um, since September. We just finalized it. That's why I was asking if, if we needed to go back to the drawing board again because we just finished going through all of the various stakeholders and departments with getting input and feedback on the district performance plan for Clark Perfect. County. Perfect, and that sounds great. Sounds like you guys are already on top of the board with the, the new data and have already pivoted to make those changes to the district performance plan. So, you know, for alignment, school plans should um, obviously um, have um, some sort of alignment with their SCP to the district plan. That's all that Karen was trying to say. Yeah, and I just, April and, and uh, Lauren, I'm, I'm just trying to use this as an example to um, help us all start to make that mental shift. So, <clears throat> and you'll notice it in this application. There's a, a much more of an emphasis on what is the district doing? What systems are changing? What is the collective responsibility? What is the collective responsibility? The school's only sub submitting a one-pager. It's really... It's really on, you know, the system to support the school instead of instead of the school supporting itself. Uh, and I'm not saying that was necessarily the case, but it's not an easy shift. And and that's why I brought this up to to help you understand the shift is occurring and why. Okay, I I'm just speaking for Clark. I don't think it's a huge shift for us because we have. We have um, always aligned our school performance plans with our district performance plan, which is aligned to the state improvement plan and all of that. So I think we're, we might be ahead of the game in that, so that's great. That is great. And just so you know, we will be looking for that coherence and alignment in this application when we review the application. And that's why I'm 
providing the scenario or we're providing the scenario so that you so that it's clear um realizing it's the first time for everybody here so um go ahead so this is lauren in, in washoe so are you wanting our um dpp included with this because we're similar to clark we're we're doing the same type of things where the school um plans are aligned to the district plan and vice versa yeah no we're not wanting the dpp included in fact you'll be pleasantly surprised at the simplicity of this application this is just a planning application for six months uh, where we're, we're making a shift here, uh, but it will become increasingly important for the DPP to align with what's happening at the school, and the state will focus much more on what the district's doing than on what the school's doing. So, so that I'm not okay. asking you to do your DPP or include it. I'm really just trying to give you some background uh, to this major shift. Okay, and then I guess I'm still very, very unclear of what you guys mean by a planning grant and meeting the ESSA requirements. So are you wanting us to engage in one of your approved vendors for six months to do planning, or do you want us to look at um, ESSA evidence-based research looking at strategies that meet the one, two, or three criteria and say that's what we're going to do? I mean. Six months is not um, a lot of time, um, especially since we're in the middle of testing and things like that with, for the schools to do a huge deep dive um, on, on this type of work. Well, that's the reason that we've simplified this and it, we're focusing only on the planning part of the school improvement for the schools for which you're applying. So what does that mean, though, when you say planning? Do you want us to engage with a vendor? Do you want us to just get together and look at best practices, citing um, ESSA evidence-based research? I'm really extremely unclear what you guys want. All right. So let's I, – I understand that confusion. I can understand how that can be confusing. And one of the best, probably, ways to answer your question is to continue with the synopsis. Uh, so that you understand what we mean by that. So if we, if you, Gabby, can you go on to slide 13? <clears throat> so you'll, you'll see the application narrative, um, the district and the school strategy example. So there's a high school out there, it's low performing, their graduation rate has improved, but there are gaps at this high school in the areas of, um, math and ELA with regard to student achievement, and there's gaps especially in the area of the Black, Native American, IEP. Sound familiar? Probably. Um, teachers at the high school level are not necessarily teaching to the NVACs. Um, some teachers at this particular site lack uh, time and also skills. But this is also a victory-funded school, and they've recently put funds into parent and family engagement. So this is, this is a background on the school. The school wants to plan for an outside vendor to come in, help them out with data. They've got a need. Help them with some um, a TD in, in analyzing, deeply analyzing that math and that ELA information and planning some data analysis and support for their department leads and their coaches. Uh, they wanna build on their existing victory funds um, and by adding to their parent and family engagement activities, maybe having a data night or two, three, um, and having, uh, having student-led conferences. And I'm talking about next school year. Obviously, we're not expecting this to happen right now. So when the school leadership team gets together, they're saying, what do we need for next school year? Generally, what's happening? So I'm going to ask you, what would you expect to see happen for the school? What would you want the leadership team to say they want to have happen uh, for this planning 
So the funding comes in, it starts in February, it ends in May or June. What could a school logistically with testing, with time frames, with schedules, how could they use this money to begin the planning process for the school to improve school achievement? What's, um, what's doable? Again, I'm not understand. This is Lauren. I'm not understanding what you mean. Like, so do you want us? To, do we have to hire a vendor? When when you say planning, to me, that's everybody getting together and looking. You know, doing an assessment, a needs assessment that doesn't necessarily fit as the criteria one, two, or three. I don't Correct. know. Maybe it's strategy. Correct. So I'm I'm getting very confused on what exactly, I mean, what are you guys going to fund? Are you going to fund PLC time for teachers to look at data, or do you want us to hire a vendor? The very first thing that, that we're going to do is look at the application and the plan to see if it's cohesive, Lauren. It's not go ahead and hire teachers for the school. There you go. They're funded anymore. It's what would work at this school. What does the leadership team think would work? for six months so that next fall a wonderful achievement plan can happen. It's not, it, it, we know school improvement needs to be planned for and implemented and sustained to matter at all. So I'm asking you, given the scenario I just provided, what do you think, what would you expect to see happen? What could a leadership team ask for? Could they ask for a vendor? Yeah, they could. Could they ask for meetings, as you said? Yes, they could. Could they ask for funds to support that? Yes, they could. Do you understand? Does that make sense? Um, I guess. Um, it's still kind of unclear to me. Um, to us, hiring a vendor right now is almost impossible because this is federal funds. We have to go through all the federal bidding. So once we get the grant, you know, if we get it on February 16th, it's going to be at least two months out before we can actually hire the vendor. It just takes that long. It has to go to our board for approval and blah, blah, blah. So are you saying then that we can cite evidence-based research of a strategy best practice being like PLC time and we can get money for teachers to work in PLC groups to examine data? Yes, PLCs are evidence-based, one, two, or three, and yes, that would be required for a school to effectively plan for improvement, absolutely. Okay, and, and then if the schools get funded um, for this planning period, then is it a competitive process again for these um, schools to apply for continued funding or yes. is there a little more of a guarantee that if they're going to do this work there's a guarantee that they're going to be able to continue this work hire the vendor that they want to pick etc cetera, etc cetera, for the next school year so this, this, this oh. is Gabby so um, and then um, Karen and Christina please um, do jump in but to um, answer your question, so this these are competitive funds, <laughs> so we can't um, you know guarantee. However, with um, having you know a holistic, like strong, um, aligned plan in place, will definitely strengthen the application for the schools or for the uh, for the district and the schools that will be applying um, for uh, these uh, our phase that will roll out in the spring for 18-19 school year which will then um, make it more likely that um, review teams will then fund the um, applications. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, this uh, is April. I'm Hi, sorry, April. Karen. I, I'm sorry to jump in. I just wanted to clarify um, it sounds like Lauren was asking whether or not the state was going to prioritize the partnering of a vendor over the school 
using the expertise at the school versus bringing in an outside vendor to conduct a needs assessment. And it sounded, Karen, like you said, it was fine for a school not to partner with a vendor, but instead to um, request funding to support the re release time of teachers or paying teachers extra duty pay to participate in professional learning communities, conducting data analysis, and analyzing um, the strengths and areas of concern at the school in order to effectively plan for the 18-19 school year. Did I capture that correctly? Um, not quite. We're, the review committees will be looking at cohesive plans and strong plans and doable plans. So having just a PLC and expecting the school on their shoulders to take on what it would take to change their PLC, to make it different than what it already is, is asking a lot. So I would think both. I would think it would, would probably the strongest application would be uh, bringing in a vendor because who really is going to do that at the school level, really? Uh, and bringing in extra PLCs, uh, training, that kind of thing, together. April, this is Christina. <clears throat> um, I think um, some of that will be addressed in the rubric, which is on page 17, and I, Gabby will go over that in a little bit to kind of help clarify. Okay, thank you. Sure. So, so you know, referring back to page 10, the application, it's really, as I said, um, there are really three parts to the narrative. There is the district strategy, and that's what we want to see written out, your comprehensive and holistic plan, um, and how is, the, how is the district coordinating school improvement efforts to address these things? And it, remember, it's one application per district. Then the collective responsibility, we really feel, and over and over again, research shows us that um, the highest performing educational systems have systems level coherence. So we're starting to shift that way, and we're looking for that in this application. Um, so be sure to be clear with that. Using that example, the examples they gave, if a district was in their DPP asking for a, an assessment or was planning to use, not asking, but planning to purchase um, an assessment system at the high school level, planning to bring in and train uh, their, their leaders with deeper data analysis, that would coincide with what the school and the, the um, example provided wants to do. They want to learn about data analysis, math, and ELA, so certainly there'd be coherence between district leaders if a vendor were brought in um, and with the school learning this information. They want to plan uh, and learn about more deep data analysis. Well, that would go with the new assessment system, right? Um, and they want to build on their existing victory funds. That would be a sign of coherence to the review committee. So for the uh, application narrative, the district strategy and the collective responsibility, and then the school strategy is just a one-pager explaining what the school leadership team has determined at this point and what they want to start to plan to do um, over the next six months and then subsequently implement when they reapply for 1003A uh, again for next year. So it's sort of breaking it into a planning and then um, an implementation phase. So then on... Um, that, I'm sorry, but I think that's why Lauren was asking, if we're going to be developing this year in the next six months, uh, working with a vendor to develop a plan, in order for that to be sustained, we would be looking for continued funding in the next year, but it sounds like that's not a guarantee because it depends on the application and because these funds that grants is competitive. Right. Is that correct? It is a guarantee. It's a competitive grant. So as I said, 
the state will be looking at how is the district building systems? What is the district changing? How are how is it going? And if if the um, if it's clear that that there has been a good use of funds for planning, your the vendor has done good work and you're ready to go, great. Most likely that would be a very strong application. But if this is not the case, then it would not be. It, it's a competitive application. It's not entitled. Correct. So I think. Yes, I think we can say that it will most likely be funded. Um, but again, because it is competitive, we can't, um, you know, again, guarantee. And we are actually looking into um, the state is actually um, exploring kind of continuing applications for those um, uh, grants that, you know, as I says, we, we can do that for. And so, um, you know, really, we've heard from um, district leaders, you know, hey, can you kind of look at it would be so much easier if we could just apply like every two years instead of every one. So like we're looking into that and seeing where we have flexibility for certain grants for that. Um, but for 1003A right now, um, again, if we if there's like, you know, a planning strong plan as evidence based interventions that are going to be implemented next year, then that would be a very, very strong plan. The review committee will most likely um, recommend for funding. Yeah, and just my two cents, it would make sense if schools are designated for CSI, say for if it's a three-year designation, that then the funding would be would align to the three-year timeline so that we're not stopping and starting and stopping and starting for some schools. So that makes sense. Yeah, Thank you. it makes complete sense. Yeah. Um, so this is Lauren again, and um, so I guess I'm still unclear because we've got Title IV A and Title I little a on um, both two in eight days. So in eight days, you want us to figure out contacting a vendor and come up with a planning plan for these schools. And so I guess also what I'm hearing is that um, schools that may be engaged in PLC work with central office staff isn't necessarily going to cut what you guys want. Like you guys want us to use a vendor. Is that what you're saying? So Lauren, Lauren, it's oh, oh. I, well, that, that's also my my take. Um, so I share her perspective and questions. Gabby, yeah, do you want to answer that one? Um, yeah, so, so no, um, it, it's, it's not, you know, that, you know, we're saying, yes, definitely use a vendor. It's just um, that, again, I think it goes back to what, what Karen was saying that, um, it, you know, the research shows that kind of like when those two things are happening at once, like when there's like somebody to like, um, help like facilitate that as somebody who um, has, uh, you know, proven um, uh, results in, in districts of similar demographics to CCSD and um, who, who's helping really like to facilitate that because it is, you know, it is a lot of work. Um, and like, you know, that PLC time and that PLC team and working with the district, um, when all those pieces come together again, like with that comprehensive, holistic and like aligned approach, um, that those types of plans are um, most likely to be successful. And so I think it's just um, kind of just a, a, com a combination um, of just a lot of factors coming together um, in a coherent way. Um, but I mean, you know, again, it, we're, we're also not saying that we will not fund um, anything that does not have to do with like planning, um, uh, for example, but um, we are saying that that, you know, is something that will be prioritized because again, this is such a short amount of, of, of funding um, time um, that we have for this. Uh, I don't know if Christina or Karen want to add anything there. I just wanted to say that it's, you know, it's three, it is three, stars in three years. So the clock is ticking. 
So the state's trying to provide this planning time uh, to help get get things underway so that in August or September, uh, you're not starting out with a vendor and with a needs assessment and starting way back then. It, it can be, the work can be starting now. And so it's actually a support to the district. And does it require work on the district's part? Yes, it does. But the end result is um, more planning time, more cohesion, and hopefully, if done right, improved student achievement. And so, um, this is Lauren, and I agree with that, but I'm just saying we've got eight days. Eight days to engage a vendor, come up with a plan, and then I'm telling you realistically, unless you guys write us a letter for exemption, we have to go through the whole process of a bidding process for um, a vendor because it's federal funds, and that is going to take at least two months. So if you look at that, we're looking at maybe April or May that we could actually engage in a meaningful conversation with a vendor and then the grant ends on June 30th. So, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but look at it from the LEA's point of view. Logistically, it's going to be a marathon even to get a vendor hired. So, um, so Lauren, this is definitely something that um, our team can um, provide some additional support in for. I mean, not just, you know, you and, and Washoe and Clark, but for any district that um, that needs it, because we understand this is a short timeline. Um, but I also will say that um, I was under the impression that uh, I thought a, a couple of districts spoke to, I don't remember if it was the FedEd group or Bruce and Manasovitz, um attorneys there and um, was saying that um, because um, we the state kind of like uh, did that part already uh, on behalf of the LEAs and uh, we have like a state approved list that there was no need for the LEAs to do that extra bidding um, uh, process so that that procurement which is I think what you're talking no about. that's not that's not true Gabby we still have to do it okay and the only way we can get around it is if you guys write us a letter and say that we're exempt because we've been round and round with our purchasing office on that and for the first round of funding we had to get a letter from saying saying that we were exempt yeah from the, so what is the, that from the federal bidding yeah. but because it's the same fy18 I, I do remember that lauren thank you for bringing that up wouldn't that letter still stand because it's the same it's, this, it's still fy18 we're not in a different like fiscal year i don't know i'd have to ask our purchasing department they're real sticklers about it because we get audited and uh -huh. it's a federal requirement. So if it's another round of funding, I don't think a blank letter covers the whole year. I think it's per uh, funding cycle. Well, whatever the grant, fund, you know, grant one, grant two, grant three. Sure. Okay. Um, so our team will, will, um, uh, reach out or if you could send an email, we can set up a time to, to chat. Um, that would be great. But I do actually want to move us on because we only have about seven more minutes and we have a little bit more to um, to get through here. I just want to mention too that I, I would believe that uh, if this is a barrier that saying would write another letter if needed. Correct. Okay. So did you want to, so we're going to move on to the next slide, which is uh, 14. So as Karen mentioned earlier, and it's on page 10, the last uh, paragraph of page 10 of the application about collective responsibility, um, and you know the highest performing educational systems have these system level coherence and alignment. So this kind of shows an example of what that might look like. It, it could even go extend and might have multiple additional layers, um, this slide right here. The charts on page 11 will need to be completed on behalf of the LEAs for each role identified, and uh, we highlighted kind of the, the superintendent, associate superintendent, and district program offices. So SPED might be Title I. How, how are those um, uh, roles supporting the planning phase of the continuous improvement cycle so that commitments and actions and the, the narratives to improve student outcomes are targeted for that particular phase at this time? And I'm, I'm going to trans transition over to the um, page, I think it's 11, of your application, and Gabby, you can take it from there.
Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so page 11 um, is basically what uh, Christina was just mentioning, but really just like writing that out. So, um, you know, writing out and you could definitely like, add um, relevant uh, focus points as needed, but just really identifying like what actions um, each level of, again, like that that system um, would be taking to help um, with this, um, this system level plan um, to drive student uh, achievement and so the, uh, page 11 is just an opportunity for um for folks to just uh, kind of like organize that and, and write that out in that chart and you'll see it's um the chart is focused on each of the different levels within a district and within for example superintendent what is superintendent doing to help with school leadership development across the district that's a, that's a big bet that's what the state improvement plan focuses on, and that's what our ESSA plan focuses on. So what is the superintendent doing there? What are the associate or ch um, chiefs doing? Um, and then what, what is the district offices doing? What are the district offices doing uh, to support this initiative? And then go back up again to data, same thing, and then focus on, on lowest performing schools. And looking on pages um, 12 and 13, so um, this right here is just um, an example of what filling this out would, would look like. So, um, for example, <clears throat> if there was the description of, of funds requested, um, you know, names of the support providers, prices, and then um, just how much, uh, excuse me, what level of evidence they meet, and then the um, evidence-based uh, citations there. Um, I will actually take this um, uh, pause. I think it's later in the slide, but I know we're, we're running out of time. So I'll just uh, pause right now and just take this time to say that we um, are currently in um, discussion, and this should happen within a few days, but with HMB for, um, uh, ePage to get the budget on ePage cre to create a second cohort um, round of funding for this round two. Um, <clears throat> and that is not uh, there yet, but will be, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll, but will be in the um, coming days there. And um, now we do still have about three more minutes um, if there's any other part of the application, oh, I'm sorry, I should probably actually go back also to the rubric, which I mentioned right here. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, again, actually, I, I think I already said this, but um, again, just um, really changing the way that, um, you know, that we are kind of like asking these questions and really wanting all systems to work together and then, um, changing the way that we are reviewing that um, as a review team with, again, comprehensive, holistic plan, with collective responsibility. Of course, evidence tiers are still in there um, and and that sort of thing there. Um, this, you know, is, again, like uh, Karen and Christina were saying, is a change, um, especially from um, round one. Um, this, however, is something that you will be seeing more of in future grants um, from the state both uh, state and, and federal. So it's, um, you know, won't be uh, perfect this time around, but um, our hope is that, you know, we all work together, um, the, the districts and NDE and, and the, the local schools um, alike, and just um, really making this something that is streamlined um, and that really, um, again, uh, gets to that um, system systems levels piece. Um, so that is um, all. And please, 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 um, our contact information for the Title I team is uh, on, let me see, what's that, page 31, so the last page of the application. Um, and we encourage you to um, reach out to us, and we are happy to um, provide um, more tailored technical assistance to whatever questions um, you may have. Because again, we realize this is a tight turnaround. We are trying to make this process um, um, as simple and, and streamlined as possible. So 
are happy to provide um, uh, tailored and specific TA um, as we need to. Uh, Karen and Christina, anything else to add as we wrap up? I don't really. I do want to suggest that if April or Lauren or, or anybody on the call has specific issues with regard to the district, with regard to the rubric, not sure about something, still feeling a little uncertain, I can understand why it's a it's a definite change. Please um, please reach out and we can we can talk more in depth without the whole group. Thank you for that, Karen. Um, I'm open to having someone call me after this. Um, this is April. Uh, call me after this conference call ends if you're available to continue this discussion. Um, this is Washo. We still have one more question. Um, Brian Pruitt, our Title I director, is here. Hi, Karen. Hey, Brian. How are you? Good. So I'll, I'll make it quick. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about a couple concerns, right? Um, sure. And I'm looking at this as the site administrator, right? And I know this this whole shift about um, the CSI schools and having the district more involved and not at all falling on the schools, get all that. But with this funding, the question came up from April and Lauren um, about what does this mean? Is this a vendor? Is this PLCs? And I'm kind of getting the feeling it's more vendor. And even if it is PLCs, it, it's redoing what they're currently doing, right, to fit this mold. And I get that, um, but I guess a concern would be a lot of our sites that are on this list are standalone sites, right? There's only one administrator. They might not have a, a coach or anybody else. And so I kind of feel that there's no planning around the planning, right? So what is the impact going to be on the site? And I know the district can help, but it's still going to have an impact on that, that administrator, um, and who is assisting with, with these changes, who's assisting with the, the vendor. Do you see where I'm going with that? I do, and, and I really thank you for calling that out because that's something we want to get away from. I think we all could agree. It shouldn't fall on one building leader to create a miracle. It's a team, including the state. So, in the case you're speaking of, I feel that there's one administrator running a school, but there are many, many people also working hard, but not bound to the school, such as yourself, that could make those calls to vendors or make the call to the to us to to get technical assistance or um, hire an outside person to come in and help with that or put together a team from the district to help out. I mean, if you're on that list, you're you're hurting, and you need something different than what you've ever had in the past, right? So, no, and, and I, I 100% agree with that. And I, but once again, it's still going to fall on the principal, right? You can have all the people you want, but the person that has to relay it with the staff, it's going to be a site person, right? And and I know in the previous relay applications, part of it was a vendor along with a data coach, right? So these schools had someone to assist with that, right? And I think that's kind of a model, right? And it's a good model, but that's just my concern, right? Well, I'm saying to you, it, could you could you make a shift because you're correct? It, it, it can't just fall on that one administrator who, if they're the only one in the building, they're, they're out breaking up a fight or they're dealing with a parent phone call or they're having a staff meet. It, they do a lot. So how can the district collectively, this collective idea, this collective responsibility, starting at the superintendent and the area superintendents, and, and then um, school improvement and your Title I team and, and everybody, get together and help these people out and, and just for the planning phase of this. Yes, it's not easy. I agree. And the time frame is way too short. but it's what it's what we have in order to use the money right now, you know, to prepare for the fall. Does, does that does that help you, yeah. Brian, a little? 
it it does. Um, I just kind of just give my thoughts, and 